I haven't been here the previous two days, but I've heard that there have been some fantastic presentations. I'll try to do justice to that, um, to their, their legacy. I'm not, I'm afraid, giving a particular regional perspective, um, but I thought I would, um, in the spirit of the session of what next and how to do it, sort of give you some ideas around um, bigger impacts of agriculture on nutrition. What will it take? A typically immodest title from me, which I will of course fail to, to meet up to, but anyway, I'll try. The outline is that there are two, two things I want to uh, talk about. First, why, why some of this puzzling evidence on uh, the links between agriculture and nutrition? Is it strong, is it weak? Uh, you know, you can talk to people and some people will say it's very strong and some people will say it's very weak. Um, and, then and then the second big point is what are the features of an enabling environment that can help strengthen the links between them? So first, um, first slide around puzzling evidence. The macro evidence is quite positive on the link between ag and nutrition, or is it? And the micro evidence is quite depressing on the link between ag and nutrition, or is it? So on the macro level, this is some new work that um, Lisa Smith and I have been doing to follow up our 2000 uh, cross-country regression analysis where we took 65 countries over a a 25-year period and did a pooled uh, regression analysis panel and fixed and random effects and, and looked at the impact of um, various underlying determinants on underweight. So we've, what we've done is we've added countries and added observations in the intervening years and we've changed the, de the dependent variable from underweight, which is low weight for, low weight for age, to stunting, which is low height for age. And um, what we've done is we said, uh, of all the different underlying variables and of, of all the uh, variance in the stunting uh, um, dependent variable that we can explain, how do you apportion out the variance to those different underlying determinants? So here you can see in the, the red and the pink, it, sorry, the, um, the, yeah, the red and the pink is safe water and sanitation. Uh, the blue is uh, things relating to care and women's status, so that's uh, life expectancy ratio of women relative to men and female secondary education. And in the, um, the green and the sort of gray area is um, dietary energy supply using the FAO <coughs> data, but we also added in energy from non-staples, again from the FAO data to see if that adds anything to the mix. Um, the really interesting thing is that roughly each of those um, underlying determinants is a third, a third, a third, a third food, a third in the women and care area, and a third in the sort of health environment area. So in a way, that's a really interesting, um, it's an interesting validation of that UNICEF conceptual framework. <coughs> now this is just global, we haven't done the sub, we haven't done the regional estimates yet, and we will do those, and I would expect the pictures to look different for Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and Southeast Asia and Latin America. But f at the global level, that's what it looks like, um, 116 developing countries over a 40-year period. So at one level, that's really quite encouraging because it says when you put food availability, um, when you put it against female secondary education and sanitation and safe water, it does pretty well. However, then you get to a really nice paper done by uh, Derek Heady at, at IFPRI, which was published in World Development, <clears throat> I think, last year. And uh, he also does some cross-country analysis, um, regression analysis, but he, he breaks down um, income growth into agricultural growth and non-income growth, uh, and non-agricultural growth. And he finds, um, using some pretty good econometrics, that there, he just can't find much of a link between agricultural growth and uh, stunting declines. Uh, that's the, that's the zero point, minus 0 0.35 without any asterisks on the right indicates that it's a non-significant coefficient. So the macro picture looks quite good, although maybe not quite as good as we think. On the micro picture, this is a, again, piece of work that we did a couple of years ago, a, a systematic review looking at um, micro interventions, micro ag interventions, and each, each row in that table is a, is a separate study that passed a certain set of quality criteria uh, to get into the systematic review. So there are good studies. 
And if you look at the, <clears throat> the impact of those different types of ag interventions, and they're things like homestead gardening, um, animal source food um, production uh, initiatives, those kinds of things, you'll see that there's very little impact on stunting. Um, NS means not significant. Um, there's a little bit more impact on underweight and uh, a little bit of impact on wasting. But in general, not much impact. So you think, well, that's pretty depressing, right? But when you look at the studies a bit more closely, you find that half of the non-significant findings, half of the NSs in that previous table, um, they had sample sizes that were too small to detect impacts, even if those impacts existed. So we went through and did all the power calculations and said, what, the, what, how big would they have to be uh, in order to show an impact if an impact was there? So while the study showed, but another, another thing to, to lift the gloom is that while the studies showed few effects on stunting, about half of them showed positive impacts on diets. Uh, the, the quote should re really be around diets, not around positive. Uh, the quote should be around diets because the studies, again, they, they looked at the impact on the food that they were particularly interested in. So if it was an animal source food intervention, they looked at the impact on animal source food consumption. But they didn't look at the overall diet, so we can't actually say much about the quality of the overall diet, which is a, a real problem. But nevertheless, I think there's a positive there. So the macro picture looks really quite positive, but maybe not as positive as, as it seems. And the micro picture, at first blush, seems really depressing, but again, I don't think it's quite as depressing as it seems. <coughs> And this is what the, and you may have seen this before in the previous two days, this is the Lancet Paper 3 in the latest nutrition series that came out. And this is the paper by Marie Ruel and Harold Alderman from IFPRI. Uh, and their conclusion is the potential of nutrition-sensitive programs, including agriculture programs, to improve nutrition outcomes is clear, but it is yet to be unleashed. And that, that's a statement that I would agree with, and I think, I think it's a really accurate and fair statement. So, how to unleash. Um, and I'm going to get really boring and put up a table. Uh, but those of you who know me know I love tables, so bear with me. This is a, a framework we developed in paper four of the Lancet series, which is all about the politics and the enabling environment for malnutrition. And after reviewing lots of literature and lots of case studies, we came up with a simple framework that said, if you're trying to create an environment where uh, nutrition can be improved, uh, you've got your nutrition-specific interventions, yes, that's really good. You've got your nutrition-sensitive interventions, that's really good. But you need an environment within which they can flourish and be scaled and they can be really potent and link up. And that's what, this is the framework we came up with. How do you build commitment for nutrition? How do you convert that into impact? And what are some, what are some of the components that go into that? So we thought framing narratives and evidence is very important. Politics and governance is very important, and capacity and financial resources also very important. So I'm going to try to apply this framework to agriculture and nutrition. So the first thing in this top left-hand box is about framing narratives and evidence for building commitment. <clears throat> so I think it's really important to ask what's the question, what is agriculture for? Is it for to raise productivity? Is it to improve income? Is it to improve food security? Is it to improve nutrition status? Or is it all of the above? And I think often we don't actually ask ourselves, what is it for? What are we trying to do? It's about reframing foods. So it's some really interesting work that Bioversity is doing to reframe perceptions around things like pigeon pea and cow pea, um, very highly nutritious foods uh, that are very inferior in, in, the, in the minds of many people uh, certainly in South Asia. And then finally, you know, understanding how agricultural policymakers and practitioners view nutrition. We don't do much research on what do the people we, what do some of you in the room think nutrition is all about? What are ag scientists, ag policymakers, what do you think it's about? Is it about more food? Is it about better food? Is it about stunting? Is it about underweight? Um, we don't do enough research on the people we're trying to influence uh, and the people we're trying to actually uh, incentivized to change behaviors. What are the triggers? What do they know? Uh, what are the barriers? And what are the, what are the very reasonable um, things that are stopping action from happening? And what are the trade-offs that they're facing in the other objectives? We don't actually do research on those issues. Um, and just to give you an example from the CG, compare the CG annual report from 2011 
to the one from, 20, from 2000. And the 2011 one has improving human health and nutrition in the vision statement and in the mission statement. And the mission statement from 2000 <coughs> talks about food security and poverty eradication. Now, mission statements um, sometimes just don't mean much to, to people working at the front line or people working in the system or partners. But if you don't have it in your mission statement, I think you're missing a trick. So it, at least it gives you a, a foothold to say, hold on a second, I thought we were supposed to be doing something about health and nutrition. Second area is politics and governance around building commitment. So again, we, um, we talk a lot about um, the commitment of agriculture to improve nutrition, but how do we actually measure that? How do we, how do we assess the commitment of those of us involved in agriculture to do something about nutrition? Is it that we have indicators in our nutrition indicators in our ag programs? Is it that we allocate a certain percentage of income? Is it that we have we formulate policies that include nutrition people in, in the formulation process? Um, and it's really important to remember that a commitment to food security is not necessarily the same. It doesn't overlap perfectly with a commitment to reduce malnutrition. And here's some work that we've done at, at IDS um, on measuring the commitment to reduce hunger and measuring the commitment to reduce malnutrition. So the vertical axis is the, it, the dots are different countries, uh, different high burden countries, 45 of them. The vertical axis is the uh, commitment to reduce uh, malnutrition. Um, and the horizontal axis is the commitment to reduce hunger. And the straight line shows you that there's obviously a positive relationship between these two. In general, the more committed you are to reducing hunger, the more committed you are to reducing malnutrition. But as you can see, it's not a very tight fit at all. And in the area I've circled, there's a high commitment to reduce hunger, but a highly variable commitment to reducing malnutrition. So if you think you're committed to reducing hunger, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're committed to reducing malnutrition. So I think we need to get better at measuring uh, commitment. And the way we've measured commitment here is using secondary data on spending, policies and legislation and putting them together. Third area is um, for building commitment is capacity and financial resources. So leadership and training. Where are the next generation being developed to begin thinking about these linked? And this is not a sour grapes because my, my postgraduate institution, the Food Research Institute at Stanford, has been abolished about 20 years ago. Um, I just don't know where the, where the next generation of leaders and thinkers in this area is coming from. And, and I think we, we all know that involving women and inviting women and empowering them so that they don't even have to wait to be invited, but that they can muscle their way into priority setting and uh, setting the agenda. We know that involving women will help us link agriculture and nutrition, but where are the leadership opportunities and training for women in agriculture? Yes, the CG has, has an initiative on this, which is great. Uh, but where are the others? So just to give you a highly unscientific um, flavor of, uh, I think, the dearth of training opportunities in ag and nutrition, I'm just sitting in my, in my office typing in studying agriculture and nutrition into Google about a week or two ago. And this is what comes up. So the Tufts program is number one. Well done, Patrick. Um, it's the number one program, agriculture, food, and environment within the Friedman School of Nutrition. That doesn't happen terribly often. Uh, there's a program from Wisconsin. I don't know why Cornell's up, not up there. Look at what's number four. Uh, really ancient history. Eileen Kennedy, Howdy Buis, Lawrence Haddad, ag nutrition linkages. I mean, it's a bit sad, isn't it? So I don't know where the next generation of ag nutrition leaders is, are being trained to think in a joined up way about these two areas. Creating an enabled environment, second column is converting the commitment into impact. No point having all this commitment if it doesn't actually do anything. So under the framing narratives and evidence, um, we obviously need convincing evidence on what works, and there isn't enough of that. And I know IFPRI and lots of other organizations are doing, I think, high quality, rigorous evaluations of ag interventions. Um, but there's also a really important debate around the nature of evidence in this area. And I think, I think a lot of us have um, thrown the baby out with the bathwater 
by by saying actually only randomized control trials are good enough. That that's the gold standard. Well, if you have a number of for various reasons, agric uh, RCTs, randomized control trials, are hopeless for looking at food systems. You can't randomize a food system. You've got to use other methods, other social science methods. Uh, and what we usually resort to, and what I've resorted to personally many times, is, is good econometric analysis. And if you if you get a so and a good econometric analysis is always about two things: associations, and then establishing whether the association is causality or not. So if you even if you get associations that are all moving in the same direction, you have no reason to think there's any systematic bias. I think that adds up to a really compelling body of evidence. And so I think RCTs are helpful in some key studies, but not always. And they're certainly not helpful if they mean that you discard all the association evidence. And here's a, here's a response from Pierre Pins for Banderson to the Lancet papers. Um, and, you know, you can read it for yourself. He's saying, he's essentially saying, we can't let the obsession of the health community with randomized controlled trials and the nutrition communities to some extent be a barrier to thinking about how food systems link up to nutrition. And I think at the moment it, it's becoming a bit of a barrier. So the nature of evidence and, the, and good quality evidence is really key in this area. Politics and governance, converting, converting commitment into, into impact. We talk a lot about horizontal coordination between sectors, between ministries. Um, there's also vertical between the center and, and districts. So I won't talk about that. But what does horizontal coordination really mean? Does it mean integration? Does it mean we've got to formulate ag, poli ag policies and ag interventions that explicitly embed nutrition components within them? And maybe, that may be the case in some contexts where capacity is good and um, service, nutrition services are good and data are good and there's, there's a, an infrastructure set up to make that happen and, and let it succeed and thrive. But maybe co-location is just as good or maybe even better, and co-location is trying to converge ag programs with nutrition programs in the same physical space, the same location, the same villages, the same communities, the same districts. Um, we also need to empower women to improve the delivery of ag that is pro-nutrition, but it's not really clear how to do that. If I was if I was in, uh, in, the, in a CGR leadership position, this would be a real conundrum for me. What can we do within the CG to empower women? Because empowering women is a whole of society approach. It's about changing norms within society. And how do you do that if you're one small but important part of society in agriculture? Now, why, why do I think there's some mileage, mileage to the co-location argument? We know that there's some mileage to the integration argument. Why to the co-location argument? And here's a paper that I wish had more uh, traction, actually, than it does. It's by Schengen, uh, Fan, and others, uh, at, uh, and, and Connie Chan Kang, at, uh, who used to be at IFPRI, I think, um, in Food Policy in tw 2004. And if you recall, those of you who are CG watchers or IFPRI watchers, they did a series of really interesting papers in the late 1990s on China and India looking at whether, whether you invest, if you invest in agriculture in um, high poverty areas or low, low poverty areas, high producing areas or low producing areas, does it give you a different impact on <coughs> poverty rates uh, as it does on economic growth? And I think this is the only one I've seen from Africa. It's from Uganda. And they're asking the question, if you invest in uh, different areas, uh, ag R&D, education, feeder roads, etc. What happens, to, uh, what happens to ag growth and what happens to poverty reduction? So if you look in this, you can see the, li the, the lightly shaded number 14.74 in the west column. These are all different areas of rural Uganda. Um, returns to investment in ag R&D in terms of ag output is the highest in western Uganda, right? It's the, the biggest number. But when you, when you think, uh, when you change the metric, to make it uh, impact on poverty instead of returns to ag output, the same investment in these different areas, you get a very different priority. It's not the west of, the, of Uganda that you should be investing in, it's north of Uganda. You get the very much, much bigger impact on poverty by investing the same amount of resources in north 
northern Uganda. Interestingly enough, you don't get much of a drop-off in ag output. It goes from 14.74 to 11.77. But you get a massive improve, improvement in poverty reduction. Now, I've not seen this analysis done for stunting or underweight or even diet diversity. And I'd love to see a study like this because I think this kind of a study says there may be mileage in co-location of ag investment and nutrition investment. Um, this is just a, a piece of uh, evidence from the World Development Report from 2012, the World Bank World Development Report 2012, the last one, which is on uh, empowering women in development. And again, it shows you, um, this is really going back, this is really going back to how do, you, how do we empower women? One part of the story is to get women involved early on in their careers, uh, if they're scientists or practitioners, through training. And this is the missing women in agriculture slide. Um, the circled area is the fraction of countries where the field of study is male or female dominated. And you can see for agriculture, um, the fraction of countries where agriculture is male dominated is 74%. So it's, I, you know, it's not surprising that, um, really, I'm not, I'm not saying that men can't be gender sensitive and be thinking about gender issues, but it's less likely that they will be than women. And when, when women are so under, underrepresented in, in training, in agriculture, uh, it's, you're not going to find too many ways through for, for empowering women within the ag, ag sector. And my final um, section is looking at um, capacity and financial resources. We need those to convert commitment to impact. So you can do this through the public sector or the private sector, and it's really good. I've, I've missed out the N here. Sorry, John, it's not a Freudian slip. Um, I've got it called it A for H instead of A for NH. But increased potential for public sector resources in ag to work for nutrition, that's great. But there's also an increased potential for private sector resources in ag to work for nutrition. So we've been doing some work with uh, GAIN, um, looking at developing tools to help uh, the private sector think about its value chains and where along the value chains um, nutrition issues can be injected in a way that improves nutrition in a sustainable way. In other words, there's a, there's a pool demand for nutrition um, so that it's not just a push through the value chains that eventually just fizzles out. And um, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's just being very systematic about value chains and looking for opportunities to inject nutrition within those. So that's, that's really it. That's putting it all together. There's lots of different things that one can do to create an enabling environment for agriculture to have a bigger impact on nutrition. Um, you don't have to do all these or any of these, but you've got to have some kind of a framework, you've got to have some kind of lens, and you've got to have some kind of desire to do it in the first place. Um, so my conclusions, ag, of course, does have the potential to dramatically accelerate stunting declines or improve diet quality, if that's the indicator that you're worried about. We have to realize that potential. We absolutely we have a moral obligation to do that because agriculture is in large part about food and to a lesser extent about water and those are two vital areas for nutrition. Now we know that nutrition specific programs, the things that are tend to be smaller scale, targeted to nutrition, they're very explicit, we want to improve nutrition status. Lancet paper two showed us by, by Zulfi Bhutto and, and others, and Patrick was a co-author on that paper, we know that scaling those up to 90%, which is a massive scale up from where they are right now, is only gonna address at best 20% of existing stunting. And that has a massive, that will have a massive um, impact on cognitive achievement and poverty reduction, but it's only 20% of the gap. So ag absolutely has to do, has to fill part of that gap. And to do that, I think we need to build this enabling environment for ag. And I think, I think we know what to do. We may not know what the best thing to do is um, and where to start in a particular context, but we know what to do, and it's up to us to make it happen. Thanks.